Good afternoon, everybody. And here we're starting with um, this today's session of the Public Climate School um, series Climate Contro Controversies in Southeast Asia. Um, Climate Controversies in Southeast Asia is a lecture series with um, experts and activists that um, do some research or are active uh, on the topic of climate change in Southeast Asia and also have developed strategies how to solve climate change. Um, yeah, until now we've only discussed the threats that climate change face to the area of Southeast Asia, but today we'll have a different um, subject. We'll be talking about what Southeast Asia can do to improve the climate change um, and to make Southeast Asia more sustainable within the means of transportation. So how public transport and transportation in general beca can become more sustainable in Southeast Asia in general. Uh, Ramona Strokel will be presenting uh, Gumit Singh who will be uh, leading the lecture today. Hello, um, my name is Ramona Strokel. I'm a student from the Department of Southeast Asian Studies. And yeah, as Lynn said before, the topic is the future of transport in Southeast Asia. And we are very happy to welcome Mr. Gurmit Singh tonight as a speaker. Mr. Gurmit Singh is um, he's a social activist and environmentalist and engineer. He got his degree in 1970 in Malaysia and he's the chairman of the Center of Environment, Development and Technology in Malaysia. He's also the advisor of the Environment Protection Society. Mr. Gurmit Singh is doing clean environment and human rights activism for more than over 40 years and it's not only reminding Malaysian people to think about future generations. Mm. He got honored for his um, engagement uh, with several awards like the Langkawi Award or the Sustainable Consumer Award. In 2017, his autobiography, uh, Memoirs of a Malaysian Eco-Activist was released. So before I hand over to Mr. Gurmit Singh, I would like to explain how the lecture works. Um, first, the lecture will last for 30 minutes. After that, we will have a discussion and then we will end the lecture at 7.30 p.m. So now I will give the word to Mr. Gurmit Singh, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will let me get my slides up. Now, oh, let me get screen sharing his top. Uh, okay, this is the problem with Zoom, I presume. Let me bring it up. Okay, that's it's working. Nice. We can see okay, it now. Let me get, get back to the beginning of my slide. Okay, uh, the future of public transport in Southeast Asia. Uh, as has been introduced, I am the chairman of the Center for Environment, Technology and Development in Malaysia, not the other way around, not development, environment first. And this is uh, going to be, I'll try to cover as much as possible within the next 30 minutes. Uh, if there are any uh, uh, questions and all that, I'll take them at the end. Now, making predictions is always difficult. I think we know all that. And especially in the case of Southeast Asia, where we have different political and economic systems, these are very, but generally public transport in the, is in the 
in the capitals and large cities is better than in the rural areas. This is probably, I don't know, true for Europe, but at least in this part of the world, you find that in the capitals, a lot of uh, focus is on public transport there. And in, and in the rural areas, they tend to be neglected or they're marginalized. And I think we should start by first examining what is the current state and we must remember that public transport is not only on land, but on water and air as well, because people tend to talk about public transport very much as a land-based issue. It is not just land only, water and air as well. Now, this is what urban land transport looks in many of the cities. This was a diagram produced in a book produced by the UNDP many, many years ago. Things have improved in Bangkok but really not that great. And this is the mess, the, the gems, the nightmares we have in Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, only place probably with the exception is probably Singapore. So the grid lock is present in almost all cities. And this has to be removed if urban buses can become BRTs, bus rapid transit. Well, but Somehow the emphasis has not been on buses, but the emphasis has been on rail. And attempts at LRTs and MRTs are likely to continue in the future, although the cost will rise. Then there are the things like the tuk-tuks and the Japanese. Many people have tried to take them off the road, but I don't think you can take them off. They serve an important function, but perhaps they need to use cleaner fuels, like even the, the trishaws or the motorized things in Delhi. They had to change to a cleaner fuel to reduce the air pollution that were causing. Minibuses are likely to make reappearance. Very often, minibuses disappear, but I think minibuses are important as to provide the first and last kilometer link because most of the public transport system, the land-based public transport system, suffer on the first and last kilometer part. How do you get to, to the catch the bus? Very often, it's one kilometer away. Then cycling is also likely to increase, especially in residential areas. Uh, everybody, I've been pushing for cycling for a long time, is slowly picking up, but at the moment, it's being seen in Malaysia very much as a leisure activity rather than a transport option. And as you know, transport cycling is, is really efficient for short distances. I think. Now, on the other hand, very often water transport, very often many people tend to ignore it, but it is the most efficient as far as uh, energy usage and pollutants are concerned because there is the least resistance from water. When you have ferries and all that, the resistance of water friction losses are minimum. But its growth along the rivers and coasts may be difficult because many of the rivers are silting up. And if this silting up is, they do not stop the silting up, then there's very difficult for boats to move up and down or ferries to move and down. But especially in the case of Indonesia and Philippines, they have a great potential to improve the inter-island ferries because, you know, <coughs> these ferries are popular, but they're overloaded and speed is quite slow. So as a result, they take a long time and, and of course, they're using diesel, which is a very polluting fuel. The potential for river and transport of goods and people are good if rivers are kept navigable. But the governments have to change the emphasis, which up to now, they used to follow the old Western model, emphasizing everything moved by road, goods moved by road. When you know goods can move more efficiently by water or by rail. But very often, the emphasis is on roads. Now, if we talk, and this is the old diagram just to give you the transport choices for low greenhouse gas emissions. It was taken from the UK transport uh, department and it shows how many grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer is 
different by different modes. And of course, in this case, the rail is the most efficient. But of course, even data like this is not being collected in many Southeast Asian countries. I know in Malaysia, for example, we do not have passenger kilometer data. You, all the official statistics don't have. Then I say, how do you plan? How do you compare? Air transport, of course, has been mush mushrooming. And of course, the Malaysian airline, Air Asia, came up with the thing. Now you can fly. And, and it sold that thing on cheap energy. But of course, it is now having a problem, both because of greenhouse gases and the COVID situation. <coughs> but from an energy perspective, it is better to have airports that need to be at least 500 kilometers apart for them and for inaccessible areas. Because right at the moment, most of the airports are very close, especially in Malaysia. Every state wants to have an airport. You know, and other states are very close to each other. And we have for a long time been telling them, why don't you have proper high-speed train going at least in Peninsula Malaysia? But so far, that has not materialized. And I don't know what it will take for high-speed trains between cities and for some of the airports to be reconverted to other uses. Because right at the moment, the airports are quite a waste of energy and other and the structure. Very often you don't have that many passengers. But yet towns why reach each other to build airports. And you must remember we have long check-in times. This was a long ago a picture produced about emissions per person in Asian cities. And we if you look at this you find that a number of Asian cities are there, but Surabaya, for example, produced the least amount of transport CO2 emissions per person. Whereas Kuala Lumpur, which is near my town here in Petaling Jaya, produced about the fourth highest, and it is almost, uh, almost like European levels of emissions per person. <coughs> and this hasn't really changed relatively. Probably Singapore has become a bit more efficient. And Seoul, of course, has been efficient all along. But the question is places like Kuala Lumpur, for example, Bangkok. Then the last uh, diagram that is shown here is, of course, the transport mode in megajoules per person per kilo, kilometer. And you find here, again, the passenger cars, which Malaysia is very obsessed with. We have got the highest concentrations of cars per person. I think the, in the state, we have more cars than population in Kuala Lumpur, for example. And that picture is only now being altered a little bit by the COVID. What are the missing essentials of the question of public transport policy? I think one of the problems is the comprehensive public transport policies are missing in most of the countries. Probably the only exception is Singapore. And this policy is comprehensive, must be really, as the word comprehensive says, they must be after consultation with the people and the users, and they must cover all aspects of public transport. And the decisions tend to be made at the center, the capital, without understanding ground conditions and needs. For example, Kuala Lumpur decides, or Putrajaya in this case, decides what the routes are, for example, in Kelantan, which is far away. Luckily, in the case of Sabah and Sarawak, those two states do decide their own routes, but not in the case of Peninsula Malaysia. And this is ridiculous. People have complained that you have bus routes that hardly serve many people. And yet, <coughs> this planning is supply side driven. People decide, oh, this is how it is, not demand side. So in other words, demand side is the missing element in most of the planning for public transport. And very few have local level authority for road allocation. We keep on saying, many groups have been saying, you need to set up local transport, local authority, who will also not only do route, but also will manage the buses and the transport. But at the moment when you have the LRT and things like that, they're all decided 
by one central unit. Then there is an important thing that has been done is in, in, we need to integrate different modes of public transport. This is not, not, not at all, it's inadequate at the moment. And the first and last kilometer of links are often missing. What are the limitations? Improvement demand depends on dependent on many factors. One of the most important is political leadership. Economic wealth could lead to mushrooming of private vehicles, provided, of course, there are sufficient roads. I remember a joke when somebody bought a high-speed car in Kota Kinabalu in the days when they didn't have roads, he could only drive to the airport and back the all at that time. So no use having cars if you don't have sufficient roads. But you know, if the roads are getting crowded, so you, there's a limit to how many cars you can really have. Then we need to have guidance from the top leadership, like in Singapore, for example. It's important, but most is lacking in many other places. There is very little interest among the top leadership on public transport. They say, okay, maybe build a build the LRT or build this thing. And now, for example, in the case of Malaysia, we we are planning to have a high-speed rail connecting us, Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. And they say, no, 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 now we will terminate it in Johor Bahru. And the, then we say, who is going to take the high-speed rail? If the whole idea was to make it easier to travel to Singapore by rail. Then physical features and train also limit which aspects of public transport can expand. For example, if there's an absence of large and long deep rivers and coastlines, this will obviously inhibit water transport, despite the fact that it is a good option. And then corruption and chronism leads to the construction of privatized and expensive public transport infrastructure. The question of tolls, for example, this has been, especially in Malaysia's case, is a highly political issue and is still not been resolved because the long-term contracts are given and these have been given at disadvantages to the state. But they are there. So this has to be avoided because it was a result of corruption and coronism. And this creeps into all infrastructure issues, whether for public transport or others. Now, Singapore is an exception. Singapore seems to be an exception to all the public and muddy public transport situation. Maybe it's a small size, but I think the determination, determination of the government is also an advantage. Right from the days of Lee Kuan Yew right up to today, the, the government is determined to make sure the public transport is efficient. And even a small breakdown has attracts a lot of attention. But good planning and implementation help, which you have done, but they've had a few problems. We can expect innovations, although the system is working. Perhaps non-motorized transport in Singapore will improve further. They have already produced uh, some important cycling lane, but they haven't covered the whole area of Singapore for recycling lane. What about the rest? This is where the problem lies. For example, in Malaysia's case, we need to break our obsession with private motor vehicles. The moment anybody graduates, the first thing they do is buy a car. Even though it means you're taking a loan and the prices of cars are much higher than as compared with their incomes. And therefore they, for example, in debts. And then the idea of the car is because it keeps them, gives them the freedom. And also in the past has been a public transport, the inefficiency of the public transport system has been an excuse to keep on buying private cars, rather than focusing on making sure the public transport improves and they don't have to buy cars. And it's always a surprise to many Malaysians when they go to Europe and they find that many people don't use their cars even if they've got cars and they travel by public transport. 
in the case of Vietnam, I think one of the reasons they have to really do is to curb the motorbike population. You go to Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City and all that, you find the place is overwhelmed with motor, motorcycles. Everywhere you go, you find motorcycles. And they must not imitate Malaysia's car ownership pattern. They have to move away from it. Otherwise, public transport will suffer. Thailand still has massive problems with motorized land transport, although they have now efficient public rail systems now working. But the coverage is limited, and they still have motorized land transport. Not only that, the lorries that keep on coming into Bangkok from the provinces carrying goods and all that, they keep on creating problems, massive problems in Bangkok. Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos need to avoid the mistakes of the others in motorized transport. They are going into the motorization, but we hope they will not make our mistakes at all. This is one possible option for an idol like Penang, for example, and this could be repeated in other places where you mix modes of public transport. For example, one could take a train to Butterworth on the mainland, then take the ferry to Georgetown, which is on the main on the island itself, and then switch to bus or minibus to your final destination. Or even if we arrive by air, we can avoid the burden of burdening the main road, which are already overcrowded. The tourists could take a minibus from the pier to the pier to catch mini ferries, which could circle the island, stopping at drop off points like Georgetown, Batu Frigi, where many of the tourists end up at the seaside hotel. They should prevent, and then they could stop outstation cars from overcrowding the island's road instead of building bridges, tunnels that the Penang state government is to determine. So, to me, we need to think of in public transport, not just one mode of transport, we need to talk about the land transport, merging with the air transport, merging with the water transport, but the entire point of view, they're efficient, they're on time, you can catch them, and you can plan your trips. One of the biggest problems of public transport, except for perhaps Singapore, is the timetables. You know, it is in, almost impossible to find timetables or buses that follow the time. They started doing some displays of when the bus will arrive, letting all speed away. So that is the other thing. And as a public transport user myself, I find that is one of the biggest problems, that when I need to go somewhere, I have to allow a lot of time that is spent waiting for the next connection. Other observations are, Overall, I would say public transport it does not have a high. Let me check whether the earlier one. Overall, public transport does not have a high priority in Southeast Asia. Funds are often misallocated to high cost LRT and MRT rather than cheaper and more effective BRT. And the inputs from users are hardly sought. And even when they petition, the petitions are ignored. So I would sort of finally like to conclude by saying. What will happen? To me, it depends on how far countries recover from COVID-19. That is, makes a big difference because right at the moment now, they say people prefer to use, uh, in fact, ask to use private cars rather than public transport because they have to, cannot because maintain the social distances and all that. So there is a big drop in public transport usage right at the moment. Now, whether this will recover after the COVID, anybody's case. Then 
the question is, what is the prioritization of public transport in the recovery plans from COVID? So that I hardly see anybody I'm talking about public transport as a focus area. Maybe they're talking about energy perhaps, but they're not talking of public transport as one of the recovery areas. Then how much spare cash do the countries have? Cash is going to be a problem because everything and now everything is going for the vaccine. You, you have very little money left even for economic development. Now, will the people clamor for better public transport? I don't, I'm not so sure. And will the current tendency to use private transport change? Maybe I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. Okay, so Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, so then we can start with the discussion now. Um, I would like first, if possible, that the students who prepared some questions starts and directly after that, everyone is welcome to just ask a question or write a question or comment in the chat. Are there any questions? Lynn, please. Um, yes, I wondered concerning um, the ecological impact, how do like the boats or transport on water uh, are efficient? Because I heard that the oil that is used by boats uh, is very toxic and uh, very bad for the environment. Um, does the impact of the boats, is it, is it smaller than the impact that uh, the amount of cars have, or is it just for like shorter distances? So that, or are there like sailing boats or rowing boats included that don't use that kind of oil? I've not seen studies on the birds, but there were some studies on animals that fed on the grass that was growing on the, by the side of the road. And many of these animals, cows, especially in goats, were badly affected in Kuala Lumpur, for example, at one stage. But at that time, we were using leaded petrol, for example. Basically, lead was the problem, not the oil per se. And I have not so far come across any studies about oil uh, affecting birds. I'm sorry, I haven't come across data. But I guess there could be a consequence. But it depends. To me, generally, air pollution, for example, we did a study many years ago in Kuala Lumpur in the center of the town. <clears throat> and we found levels of lead, of course, were high. There were levels of sulfur dioxide were high. And <clears throat> levels of nitrous oxide were high. Even nowadays, we have the air pollution index, which is published by the Department of Environment. And I've been every day looking at the air quality for my town where I stay. And I find that most of the time, <clears throat> There is ranges in the region of 70 to 80, uh, which is not a very healthy level moving towards, but it's even average without the haze coming in. So this is due to local air pollution of motorized vehicles. So I think the threat to human beings is quite great, but somehow people in Malaysia and many developing countries do not seem to consider the air pollution as a real problem coming from motorized vehicles. They are only excited when you see the haze uh, and that affects the breathing, that affects the visibility, but this is the invisible part of it. So in a way, I would say <clears throat> human beings tend to react to what they can see rather than what is invisible. Are there other questions? <laughs> There's some more questions. There are questions in the chat. Yeah. No. 
I can't see them. <laughs> um, sorry, no, on civil society, something about the role of civil society. There was a question on uh, maybe the chat. I think you have to switch on the chat. Yeah. Role, role of civil society in demanding improved sustainable transport. How could civil society contribute for the urban transport shift towards affordable transport options, especially active mobility and public transport? Definitely, I think uh, we, uh, but before that, there was another question on LRT, MRT, BRT again. Uh, okay, let me try to answer the LRT. This LRT is the light rail transit. This is basically uh, trains that uh, is actually like your, uh, in Germany, you have your, uh, the trains that you, the underground, they call it the underground thing that goes both above the surface and the ground and carries a limited number of coaches, it's about four coaches or so. Whereas the MRT is almost similar to it, but it carries much, much more coaches has about eight coaches or something like that. And it tends to go longer distances, but it also has both underground and over the, uh, above ground operation. Whereas the BRT is bus rapid transit. This is a proposal where you actually allocate road, road space. You take from the existing roads a dedicated lane and you dedicate it to the buses. Only the buses can move. So the idea is it's a dedicated bus road where, like for example, the Trans Jakarta BRT. That is one good example of a successful BRT, which has been very successful. But we have been trying to, Malaysia, trying to get the Malaysian government to do a similar thing for many years on the Federal Highway, which collects Port Klang to Kuala Lumpur, passing to Petaling Jaya, and it has to, hasn't taken off. So that is the difference between the LRT, MRT, and BRT. Now, as far as the role of civil society, obviously it is there, but the frustration is, in, at least in Malaysia, I find not very many civil society people actually are interested in the whole issue of sustainable transport. For example, when we organize a petition trying to get people to say, oh, we want to improve the public transport system, we had a lot of problem connecting signatures even and we had to go when we went to the LRT station and all that and got, got people to try to sign the petition. People are running away. And this is for them, for their case, for better transport. So civil society, I think, needs to accept for some specialist group like transit and all that in Malaysia. They really need to talk about the whole question of mobility. In fact, I would argue mobility is not only just active mobility, but accessibility, because the whole purpose of mobility is accessibility. We want to access people, we want to access goods. So we need to talk about accessibility. And if you talk in terms of accessibility, there's even a role for telecommuting. Teleworking is also, and having meetings like this, for example, only now we are having things by virtual. This could have been, we were suggesting people in Uttarajaya, for example, have teleconferencing, so those of us who don't want to travel to Putrajaya, can go to a common place in uh, uh, KL where it's serviced by public transport and take part in a meeting by teleconferencing. So teleconferencing to me is one way of improving <coughs> the a purpose of mobility. Okay. Um... Are there some other questions? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna read them out of the chat. Um, yeah, only two questions of her. Can you explain the R L R T M R T B R T? Yeah, you you just now. did that. We uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. But in, if no one else wants to um, start. Um, you were saying, you know, Singapore is kind of like the, the only place where they've really got it sorted. But um, I would question that because um, it seems to me that the problem of, of the big city transport systems is that um, they are trying to 
introduce public transport while at the same time still being committed to a basic transport system which is um, based on uh, cars on private vehicles as you were criticizing oh, no. and this is why as a limited the sales of cars it's not very difficult to buy a car in Singapore it made it very difficult for you to purchase a car in Singapore uh -huh. mm. so see, Singapore has been controlling cars very very strictly for the last 20 years mm. okay because I've just looked at the statistic and um, they have uh, 170 cars per 1000 uh, inhabitants and Indonesia has 100 cars per inhabitant. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me Singapore could be a leading beacon because it's a city state and it has it's a very rich country. Yeah. Um, but they don't seem to be moving towards a, a car free mobility system for the cities, which would be actually the only uh, f f from my perspective for climate change, the only feasible type of uh, mobility system for the future. But they're lagging behind here and they could actually be uh, taking a much more um, progressive leading role for the region if they were to show the region that it's possible to develop a mobility system without private cars um, and based on more intelligent public transport systems then uh, i think that would make a much bigger difference than what they're doing now which is basically saying we are affluent enough to afford nice trains but we also stick to having uh, you know a road system based on private cars. Yeah, I, I agree with you. They are a bit stingy on trying to share information even with the, the country. For example, I, uh, I I was trying to do a study on uh, distance traveled by bus, passenger kilometer and all that. And I was told that they had data, they had actually data on uh, the bus usage and the passenger kilometers, how much CO2 was emitted on the average of the buses. But they would not share the data with me. I went to the embassy, the high commission, uh, I wrote to them, no. So I find that that is not, they're not willing to share information which could help others because here I was trying to find out our buses, are they performing well? And I wanted to compare them with Singapore buses right? because they're supposed to be better uh, and well maintained. I think the one of the basic problems I find of why we a lot of people are against buses, like the written question about other other countries also, say Indonesia, is flexible. Engines are not maintained. And because they're not maintained, you get flexible. And especially if you use diesel. And, and that puts many people off of buses itself. Whereas in Singapore's case, you have they are well maintained, they have a maintenance quality, there are no such problems itself. So things like that, how do they achieve that maintenance issue. Can that be done in other countries and all that? I think, to me, maintenance is a very, very important issue in any form of transport, and especially in terms of buses. So I, I would agree with you that they definitely can do more. They can, in fact, even, I would say, they can actually even look at the whole issue of water transport, because they're only focusing on the, the port as a whole. They're not using water transport to go around the island, for example. They need not have to go drive by, even by the rail. They could still have a, a boat, a, a ferry boat stopping everywhere, and they could serve the island itself. So there are opportunities in Singapore, I agree. Let me look at this lady Gabriela's uh, comment. She has says an explanation why have government not started to tackle the problem of public transport decades ago, before the numbers, <clears throat> I, I, I would argue that it's a, in a way historical, in a way vested interest, it's in a way there was no pressure because the people who used public transport in the past generally were the poorer people, the lower class. And you know whether you like it or not, the lower class do not carry much of a political class. Only now, for example, in Malaysia, Middle class has started using public transport. Then pressure has been going up. So I've been trying to persuade the middle class to put more pressure so that the poorer people will benefit. So that it's not only they who benefit because the poor have no choice but to use public transport. But in the past, they have been ignored and the middle class and all that just bought cars. And the government made it easy for them to buy them. So the problem 
has been predictable, I would say, I agree. Uh, but the other issue is a motorbike. The motorbike issue has become, well, we know about motorbike engines, for example, have <coughs> pollution problems in the past, single, uh, two stroke and single stroke issue. The, they were providing mobility for the poor. Com and those who couldn't take bus would take a, motor take a motorbike, even now. So the question now is, how do you try to get rid of the old bikes on the road, which are not efficient? It's a political issue. Many of the people who own it are the, the voters, the rural voters especially. And you find very difficult for the government to now get rid of the motorbike. They tried at one stage. There was talk about uh, having replacing engines with two-stroke engines and all that that Taiwan was doing. Somebody in the motorbike industry, when they saw the Minister of uh, Domestic uh, of International Trade, he said she put her foot down and said, no, 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 we cannot under undermine our motorbike industry of existing motorbikes but can take, uh, carry on. So I think that is the other problem. Okay, um, are there other questions? Um, if not, I'm gonna read the long one from the chat. Um, so from Gabriella Weichert, I am most familiar. Gomez, he's he's just responding to that one. Uh, you don't have to read them out because Gomez is uh, actually um, responding to them directly. Okay. Come on, everyone. It's a, like a topic that uh, impacts everyone in Europe as well. It's, uh, mm. we, we're all suffering from the pollution of uh, city, city transport systems. Um, in Germany, it's meant to be such a fantastic environmentally friendly country, but we have some of the highest levels of um, air pollution. Um, so come on, let's get cracking. Let's start discussing with uh, Gourmet. He's joined us from Malaysia in the, at 11 o'clock in the evening. So please um, contribute. Actually, uh, I, I have an observation that the Germans seem to like cars also a lot. Right? So there is the German obsession. They want to have the autobahns and all that so they can drive the cars as fast as possible. Is that still a prevalent attitude in Germany? I think maybe I can jump in. Mm. I uh, yeah, my name is Antje from uh, Tourism Watch. We are uh, advocating for just and future-proof tourism. And in this regard, for sure, we have uh, also a perspective on uh, mobility. Um, I like, so, so I don't have a question, but I, I'd like to elaborate further on um, this issue of mobility is accessibility. Um, the political question who is deciding which mobility modes are preferred. Um, that you are using like public money taxes for building airports, um, which is not helping anyone to have access to the market, which is the basic mobility that people need to go to the hospital, to go to the market, but this they are not doing with, 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 with airplanes, um, but with other modes of transportation and in too many countries or in, in, in the most countries, uh, people are still walking. Um, so we have this, this huge gap, I think, uh, between um, the mobility uh, mode that poor people have to use and are using, and then um, um, big infrastructure development in mobility um, that is not accessible to them. So I think this is a very important point that you made, um, focusing again, who is making the decisions, which mode of transportation is preferred. And um, yeah, in this regard, I, I yeah, just want to, um, to echo what you said, that uh, mobility is a, is, a, is a serious political question and one of uh, the questions that will decide on the future. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we can discuss a little bit more also about um, the inter interrelations between the different modes of transportation. We have done a study in India on uh, transportation um, where we asked civil society, climate change activists, 
why they are not really advocating against airports and the response was because the pollution of the cars is more severe and more obvious what you also uh, said that it's evident if you see a problem then you act on it but for example um, climate change um, coming from uh, air transportation you don't see on the ground um, so I'm, I'm yeah as I said I don't have a question but I would love to discuss uh, this further with you how uh, this, uh, this focus on individual car transportation and the pollution coming from this brings people to use planes because they think it's cleaner, but in the end it's the it's, uh, same um, effective, uh, negatively affecting um, the climate. So do you see from your expertise like a political debate on this or a public movements um, that are addressing um, those mobility questions? We, we, we have actually done uh, one project which we call sustainable transport, we did one, where we were trying to get people to switch to better modes of transport than they were doing at the community level, local level. But we found the response rate was very, very poor. For example, we took uh, uh, DG, which is a mobility uh, 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 what media company. Everybody used their computers and all that. We had 100 people signing up initially, and they were supposed to keep uh, records of how they travel every day to work. And they were supposed to do that over a period of one year. You know, after about six months, most of them dropped off. And eventually, all of them said, oh, we can't change our mode. We, we, this is the only mode, you know, we, we gave them options. We said, there's a train service coming to your place from where you can take a bus. Your company provides a bus, they didn't switch over, they still drove their cars. So we find that transport actually is one of the hardest things to change people's habits of transporting. Even when we did our local people, we did a project of eco-mobility actually. And we were trying to persuade people to come from an area, park their cars, walk across the, the playground, and then walk across or cycle across to the LRT on the other side. But the, it, the, the authority helped us do everything. But the problem was they were not willing to do anything to overcome the problem of busy highway that they had to cross. They were not willing to do anything. So the, the project in a way didn't uh, work out. So I, I think there is a lot of areas, but I find you can look in a data from different countries in terms of transport, uh, in terms of greenhouse gases, I find one of the sections that is typical, I see almost no country able to reduce their transport emissions. Almost all countries, their transport emissions are more or less steady, or not, if not going up. Even Sweden, for example, I was looking at Nordic countries, they, they have not dropped their transport emissions. So that is a real problem, and the reason we found is all sorts of achievements. We did a study of people, how much energy they use. And we found that people, 70% of the energy was in transport. 30% was within the, in the household itself. And the transport part, we go, oh, we got to take children to school. We have to do this. So everything is, and when we ask some people who took part in another project to give them options on how they can transport, out of 50 people, only three change your modes of transport. One bought a bike motorcycle and started going to work by motorcycle. The other person started walking and then taking public transport. And the third person, I think, saw this car and bought a motorbike. That sort of thing. But beyond that, the rest, no change, not willing to change. So I think that's an inherent uh, resistance to change transport mode. So this is also, in a way, something that civil society has to look at. Now, if I can answer the question on the screen, uh, <clears throat> public transport is not in the case of Indonesia and not far until 2024, we will develop many highways, transportation will be powered by biofuel. Now, the problem with biofuel, this is the problem. Even in Malaysia, we are trying to use, get biofuels on public vehicles not because of any great climate contribution. It's basically 
to keep the palm oil industry running because when they got surplus oil and they cannot sell it, they want to convert it into biofuel. So biofuel is basically in both in Indonesia and Malaysia state being produced basically as a bunker when the times of when there's low world demand for oil, you convert it into biofuel. So biofuel and also we have criticized biofuel because produced from palm oil because you're converting a product that is much nutritional value into a fuel. Eh? And you're converting things, bio, palm oil to other uses. So biofuel is not the best use of palm, palm oil. We have always said biofuel should become bio waste. It should not come from, it should be from cellulose material that can be uh, produced as a waste from the waste. We disagree with any biofuel that's produced from a raw material. It should be come from a waste as well. Yeah, no other original questions? There is one in the chat. Um... How high would you rate the possibility to create compact cities in Southeast Asia, meaning making it more accessible for people to satisfy their mobility needs in general without creating traffic? I, I think uh, it will vary from country to country. And I think the, you have to look at the situation. You need to have a buy-in to try to, you definitely need to get political interest in you need to make it an election issue if possible. That people say, we need better public transit. That's an election issue. And that issue will fly if enough people are willing to vote for it in a democratic country. Where, of course, there's no democracy or there's pseudo democracy, then no matter what you say and do, will make any change, right? Then the only way will be revolution, basically, I presume. But I would argue that we have to, we can use climate change, but a lot of people somehow do not see the connection between climate change and transport. And I've been telling people, and especially using Malaysian statistics, to show that transport emissions in Malaysia actually are the second highest to energy emissions, <coughs> energy production issues. So transport is a basic, major emitter of pollution and greenhouse gases of course. So there is definitely a potential for, if we can work on transport <laughs> to reduce the emission. And the only way I can see is improving public transport. Maybe I can ask another question uh, because uh, in the aftermath, well, in, in the uh, situation of COVID, many people change to individual transportation to their cars um, because of this assumption to be away from masses, to be in a healthy environment. Um, how is this, is this addressed publicly somewhere? Because I can assume that before COVID, the um, traffic jams and everything in the cities was a highly discussed topic in many Asian cities. So no. I'm wondering how this is um, framed now um, in newspapers or by political decision takers? I remember getting into a debate, uh, comparing myself. I, I went for a meeting in Putrajaya using public transport. <coughs> I calculated the amount of money I spent and the time I took. The other person who drove a car took half, less than half the time that I took to go get to the place. And he paid less than what I paid. So public transport is not even cheaper. So we have to make public transport as a preferred option and it has to be a cheaper option for us. To me, that is the only way that you will be able to undercut the car. The car has a stronghold and now in the COVID case, you are not, you are alone, you are safe. You are not in touch with anybody uh, having possible COVID itself. So that has been, of course, the reason. But people do not realize how much road space they take, how much traffic jams they create, and how much time they waste. But that depends upon routes they take. 
if you are going to an area where you don't have to go to the traffic jam, then you're not that, that affected. Are there some more questions? Not there was one, maybe it was a little, little bit similar, but um, I read it. Um, the, what about free public transport in bigger cities? Did any Southeast Asian country city consider that? As this idea is discussed controversially, what do you think about it? You mean mega cities? Bigger cities, transport in bigger cities, public transport. Yeah, public, public transport, I said, in, in big cities is definitely better than in rural areas and in smaller towns. But again, the question is go varies from city to city. For example, if you want to go to Manila, Manila is public transport and compares to Kuala Lumpur transport and Singapore transport. Obviously, there is not really very much too strong because except maybe perhaps may not be, may be bad in, uh, in the case of Manila because they're always in a mess sort of thing eh? with the jeepneys, with the, the vehicles, and they don't really have trans BRT. They just put an LRT. They don't have a BRT at all. <coughs> Whereas KL doesn't have a BRT, but it has got these LRTs. So in a way, when I travel by public transport and I can rely on the BRT to get to my destinations on time. Whereas during the off-peak periods, I can take the buses when I have more time and they, they were cheaper perhaps and achieve the same thing. But very often there's a choice between buses and all that. But I don't think all mega cities give choices enough. They do not, in other words, again, I would argue that the transport system is not adequate. It's not adequate and it has been basically treated as transport for the poor or for the marginalized. Only recently, I remember once they started air conditioning vehicle, buses and all that, then only I started seeing people with neckties and the carrying jackets and the briefcases getting on them. Before that, you could never see that in the necktie getting on board a bus, for example. Um, I think the question was specifically referring to free public tra transport as a oh, public free. service offered by the city. Yeah, that is being done. For example, in the case of Talindaya, there is a free bus service, but it's limited routes. There, none of the mega cities, as far as I know, are offering total free public transport all over the city. They offer in selected areas, for example, in my area, there's a bus that can go to two or three LRTs and can take me down to the other side of town, but it's on a limited route. Whereas in Kuala Lumpur, they have same rapid KL, there's a rapid KL that also serves a few routes, but not the entire bus system itself. So maybe that is one possibility, but I think the governments need to be convinced that the money is saved uh, the, the money spent on the buses is safe on the health of the people, paying for the health of the people. Right at the moment, the government does not really internalize the health costs, which you have done in Europe, for example. Your health costs are internalized so that even though your buses may not be free, they are highly subsidized. Sort of thing. Here, when they're subsidized, all people say we are losing money on that. Are there some more questions? Um, I saw Lynn raised her hand. Um, yes, but it was partly answered. Uh, I wanted to ask whether the smartest idea would be to make public transport more attractive, or is it more important to like ban or put higher taxes, for example, on airplane rides and uh, private vehicle um, institutions and uh, consume? Um, or do, should, should it, um, that be intertwined? And also if the focus is on public transport and making public transport more attractive to the, to the 
people of the cities. Um, I, I presume the ultimate uh, solution is to make uh, public transport more attractive. It's, it's mm -hmm. better, better, given a choice, people have a choice. And the choice of public transport is always a better choice. So you have to make it such a way that it's comfortable, it's, served, it's comprehensive, it's easily accessible, and people don't have to think think twice in getting into public transport vehicle and they can plan their journeys. Now at the moment, you can't plan your journeys in many cities. And therefore you end up taking even now Grab and other things that, you know, vehicles. I have to, have to take it sometimes myself because I've ended up, I've come to a place then there's no way I have to call a, a private car to take me. That defeats the purpose of having used parcels. But sometimes that's the only way I can get to the that my final destination. So, as a public transport user, I go through this thing almost every time I travel. And so, I think the ideal thing would be like in the case of Europe, for example, make it as the preferred choice. People would say, rather than take my car, I would say I got a special discount ticket. I I will save money. I will travel. I can travel in comfort and. I, I get to where I want to go and I can plan my trip. So I don't have to use my car at all. No, no, you get the Europe, many people I gather in, especially in Austria, I don't know how many in Germany, they have cars, but they use them only for weekends. And they go to work and leisure and all that by public transport. That's what we want to see happening in South Association. Um, yeah, I have an ad additive uh, question. Uh, what systems from, for example, Europe or other parts of the world do you think? What systems? Germany, but also in other cities in Germany, in Europe. Um, is this something we should, um, or that should be implemented also in Southeast Asia, or should we um, have more trains, more train transport, or more buses, or uh, what would be like the most practical solution to make public transport and emission-free transport possible? One thing I forgot to mention in my presentation is I think we have to think in terms of the fuel switch eventually. We have to switch to hydrogen. And hydrogen, whether it's from fuel cells, but more likely hydrogen from renewable energy sources to drive our vehicle. Because in the past, we have driven, depended on oil, in the internal combustion engine. Even the electric vehicle, the electricity is still generated from fossil fuels and all that. So unless we can get the electricity generated from a renewable energy source, so for example, supposing we were to put a solar panel on top of a tuk-tuk and use that to drive a fuel cell and use a fuel cell, a hydrogen from there to drive the vehicle. That's the sort of things that we need. I think that's the way the future is going to be. Hydrogen is a fuel, not electricity. Now people are talking about electric cars. People want to make electric motors because they move. Of course, the electric motor was used before when they started on the car actually in that street long ago. And that was overtaken by the internal combustion engine. And the internal combustion engine is ruled the world for a long time. And now they're going back to electricity. In a way, it's good, but electricity is still has a problem because fuel is fossil fuel most of the time, unless you can get electricity from solar and other renewable sources. So ultimately, I think we have to think in terms of hydrogen as a driver. Are there some more questions? Are there more questions? If currently no one else has a question, I apologize for jumping in, but maybe I have one. Uh, you asked whether the Germans still like their cars and I can tell you that yes, they do. Uh, but I was wondering that um, in my experience, in the Western Hemisphere, the, the problems arising from this are very deeply connected to capitalism. Like in post-war America and post-war Germany, the, the suburbanization and the feeling of liberty of 
having your own home and having your own car to travel freely very much influenced the way that cities were designed and that car ownership spread. And it became so central to our conception of the city that it should be accessible by car to people that travel from the outskirts. Do you feel that this is being tackled differently in Southeast Asia, or is it basically the same pattern? Well, they follow the same pattern, but I think we, I've been advocating, for example, the idea, why can't we have a city where you don't really have to travel by car and where you can have a self-contained city, all your shops and all that, I understand. People live in the center, shops are in the periphery, and all your services can be provided by just walking or at the most cycling. And in rare occasions, you have to travel long distances. In other words, work and play and work and living should be as close together. That sort of development has not really been tried so far. Can I, can I have a question? Is it still time? A little bit, like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, short question. Um, from, from, from all the question, it seems like um, Southeast Asia is not really building their transportation system. I wonder if you can explain, is it have relation also with the industrial, um, you know, industrial uh, automotive things? And also um, the agreements between uh, countries, for example, to build the uh, flyover and kind of that, because it's kind of uh, what you call it. It's like the you know the cycle is. It's kind of there is no um, answers on that because um, you have more uh, a road, but it's um, more. Uh, tax decreasing, for example, easier to get the motorcycle, uh, mm. kind of that. So uh, could you explain the possibility, how, how the relation with that actually? Thank you. I, I would argue that, uh, of course, I agree with you in the sense that it has been very often, most of us have tended to follow the West. We have said, ah, they, they did it in the West that way. Oh, we, we should do it that way. That's called modernization. So called everybody in Southeast Asia wants to be modern. And modernization transport also must follow that. But the question is many of these transport locks us into systems that we cannot move away from. For example, if you want to have a car, then you have enough, you must have roads for the car itself. And, and people just don't want to have a car and sit idle in the car park and travel by bus. They want to use the car. But I think on the other hand, there are also some counterproductive thing we have bridges that lead nowhere. They have, they have no end. Like for example, in Malaysia, in Putrajaya, there's one bridge which is right in the middle. There's no beginning, no end, because nothing. It was supposed to be for an underground system which has not been implemented. It has been there ever since Putrajaya was built. Similarly, <coughs> there are other places where they build, for example, in Iskandar, they build a lot of flyovers who are asking this. Friend, I said, why do you have so many flyovers when I see very few vehicles on the road? Oh, this is for the future. But I said, why do you have to build now? So there's a lot of also Western construction industry that benefits the cement industry benefits. Build as many roads as possible, even though they may be handy. So I think it's a question, as uh, uh, Clyde mentioned just now, capitalism in a way. It's part of the capitalist system also. So we need to really look at the political and economic system, and we need to work at that level also. You say, who does it serve? The question should be, who does it serve? And that's why I keep on saying, planning has to be demand side driven. If there's no demand for public transport, you don't provide the public transport. You don't vehicle, build vehicles. Similarly, <coughs> you, do, you plan only where there's a demand. Which people want to travel, you build them. So I think it's a mixture of everything. And I, I tend to agree, at least in the case of Malaysia and other countries that I know of, people have been caught with this catch up with the Western world. Even the idea of an LRT, for example, was foreign to us. 
until our great Prime Minister Mahathir Ewan's face, oh, decided to build it. And it was very costly. And he gave it to his friends. They built four or five different people have given five different LRT to me. And they could not match. For example, the LRT, the PMR area, has a system that is Canadian. They could not, when, <coughs> when the track broke down, they could not do anything with a used spare parts. From the other thing, they had to wait for components to be thrown from Canada to get the track working. And we were laughing. He said, simple, I'm an engineer. And I say, engineers want to make sure you have that system that much. You can use spare parts from one another. But here was a system that collapsed within three months, but it has given you a cloning. So I, there's a whole issue of mishmash of what once more. All right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this event is slowly coming to an end. And um, Mr. Gumit Singh, would you like to say a few final words? Now, all I want to say is we really need to be focused on public transport. If we want to serve the ordinary common person, whether middle class or anything, but we also have to think in terms of political reforms, which are necessary, and maybe economic reforms because public transport does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in a living dynamic thing. And all the factors that are operating political and economic and even corruption has a bearing on it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I want to say thank you to Mr. Gumit Singh for giving us this interesting lecture for tonight. And thank you for everyone who um, took part in this event. Yeah, um, I would say the lecture is finished for tonight. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Ankündigung nächste Woche, nächste Woche. Yeah, das wäre ich, aber jetzt sind äh, fast alle schon weg. <laughs> uh, so everyone who's still here, um, thank you for staying <laughs> for a minute. So our lecture series will take a short uh, winter break. So for the next three weeks, there will be no lectures, but we will start again on the 13th of January, where our speaker is Chris Lang. Um, he has monitored the Red Plus side um, for nearly 12 years, and he's also an activist and writer. And he will talk about the false promise of Red Plus in Southeast Asia. So I hope everyone can enjoy these few weeks without a lecture and maybe digest what happened and what, what we learned. And then we can all join in the new year and listen to Mr. Lang's speech. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>